Did you see that right there? I remember when I was 12 or 13, I watched a girl on a family vacation blow up a beach ball in that same exact spot. She's holding the ball between her lips without using her hands. It's floating on her chin like a bubblegum bubble that's burst. Bigger and bigger. It's like by opening up her mouth, she's opened up a door to allow a part of herself to pass into the ball. Bigger and bigger. And when she's done, she closes the nozzle, sealing a part of herself inside. I watch her toss the ball into the air. Until the wind takes it and sets it into the sea, and it immediately rides out beyond the breakers. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, white. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, white. And then it stops, as if it has something to whisper to me. And I start to get nervous, like I'm in the theater beside the girl, and I'm about to put my arm on the armrest beside her. And I start to count to 10. Uh, one, uh, two, uh, three. I tell myself at 10, I'm going to jump up and rescue her ball. Uh, three, four, uh, five, uh, six. The ball turns. The feeling, it builds. Uh, six, seven, eight, uh, nine. She looks right at me, and I look right into the sand. <laughs> nine, um, nine and a half. Nine and a half of a half. <laughs> Ten, I grab my surfboard and I walk right up to her. From the desert I come to thee to ride my plastic stallion shod with fire. And the winds are left behind in the speed of my desire. Before thy window I stand. My voice is deep, my inflection meaningful. So huge, she says, so impossible to conceive. Are you checking this out? She may be by all accounts my dream girl, man. The one. Actually, she doesn't speak English. And at 13, I've got nothing but a prepubescent falsetto chirp of a voice. If I said hello to her, <clears throat> hello, hello, <clears throat> hello, I most likely sound like a pterodactyl and scare her half to death. Besides, I'm turned to the side so she can't see my hideously acting face with the bumps on my back. No, she just stares off into the water and I, I press my arm into my surfboard to make my muscle look bigger. <laughs> and finally, I just walk away. And as I throw my surfboard into the ocean and climb aboard, everything is as it should be. I'm alone. I'm in my element. I can't hear people asking me why I'm so quiet or do the weird things that I do. Oh, Mother C, even at 13 you were there for me. And I'm going to freeze that moment. I'm having what I call a moment in rice. That's right, you heard me, a moment in rice. You know the other white grain? Now, now what do I mean? Rice, a bowl of white rice, white uncooked rice, is made up of hundreds of individual rice grains. None to the, to the eye seemingly any different from the other. Yet when I pick one grain out and put it in the palm of my hand, it suddenly becomes different. And I don't mean in some kind of esoteric electron string theory, what you are seeking is seeking you kind of way. I mean that this one grain of rice becomes part of your personal narrative, kind of like a character in your story. This one grain of rice, it's like a microcosm, a metaphorical microcosm of something much greater. And it's easy and effortless. It becomes part of our personal story. Now, the moment in rice comes in three phases. This is me on my surfboard. It's the creative impulse. It moves to the crossroads and then bookends with what I call the invisible door. Now, this creative impulse, me on my surfboard, it's easy and effortless. Struggle is so 2011. This doesn't take a business plan to create. We don't sit around and say, hmm, I think I need to come up with a mission statement for my creative impulse. Let me create a business plan for that. No, it doesn't take a team of food scientists from, from MIT. It doesn't take a, a, a spreadsheet. And it definitely doesn't take a big Hollywood budget to create it. Actually, it happens in retrospect. We find ourselves in the creative impulse, teleologically speaking, which means from the back end looking forward. We find ourselves in that. One moment, we're paddling on our surfboard. The next, we wake up at a TED Talk. And I know as fellow surfers, I mean, as fellow entrepreneurs, you know what I'm talking about. OK, unfreeze. 
Oh, Mother C, even at 13, you were there for me. And I began to paddle for that ball. One, two, three, four. A gorgeous girl's breath is inside that ball. One, two, three, four. If I get it, she'll like me more. One, two, three, four. I'll be the conquistador of the seashore. One, two, three, four. This would be great for my memoir. One, two, three, four. She's like an exotic Egyptian version of Drew Barrymore. One, two, three, four. I paddle until I'm exhausted. I sit up on my surfboard. The beach behind me is a thin blonde line, and the girl's a tiny dot. And the ball, it hovers on a crest and then disappears and then reappears as if to tease me. And I'm going to freeze this moment. This is the crossroads of the moment in rice. I'm out here and the water is suddenly deeper. I've gone from the top of the food chain and fallen off the ladder to the bottom of the food chain. There are things under me that I don't know about. The crossroads. I have to go much deeper to continue because the moment in rice is all about being easy and effortless. And so I go deep into my heart until I begin to hear my heart talking to me. Okay, unfreeze. On my surfboard, as I contemplate whether to go forward or backwards, I get a glimmer. It's the story of my heart. That glimmer is an image of me and that girl. I don't even know her name. We're on a green hill somewhere, a picnic basket between us. One of her hands of mine, her other hand on that beach ball. And then I go the effortless route. I turn my surfboard back around and paddle back to shore. The ball becomes like a tiny dot and then eventually disappears. And as I walk up to the shore, the girl smiles, touches my shoulder and says, something, 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 and thank you. And I, I feel so awkward, I almost take her out at the knees with my surfboard. I take my surfboard and walk over to my family. My family is spread out on the beach. Eight family members, eight artists, four immigrants. My grandmother and grandfather are standing up near the water's edge. I put my surfboard down and I stand up beside them. My grandfather, he's got a bald head and a huge belly like a robin. He's got his trunks pulled up under his, under his armpits. He looks out to the ocean, out to the point where I had paddled to. And my grandmother, her skin is white as a sheet of paper. She, her lips are, are ruby red. She's got a big floppy pink hat on. She looks out to the same spot. I look out there too. I know that my grandparents wouldn't have any idea about a creative impulse, about a moment in rice. I mean, they used to be artists, but my grandfather and my grandmother aren't anymore. I mean, my grandfather, he ice cream sandwiches and watches Kung Fu reruns on TV. And my grandmother, she works at the Department of Taxation. They wouldn't know the first thing about a creative impulse. I watch the horizon as they do. And I begin to think, I wonder how far I would have paddled for that ball. I wonder. If I had paddled far enough, would have someone come to rescue me? And then maybe someone would have had to come to rescue the person that had come to rescue me, and so on and so forth. I began to wonder how far anyone goes for anyone. I began to wonder how far I'll go before I turn around. I'm going to freeze that moment. Here comes the invisible door. The visible door happens after the creative impulse. It happens in the moment of rice after the crossroads. Walk through the invisible door and your life is changed forever. Unfreeze. My uncle walks up. He's the architect of the invisible door. He stands and looks at the horizon with my grandparents, my mother's parents. And then he bends over and he says, in this very distinct accent, I want you to know that uh, I have filled out an application and sent it in to the German government to give back all the things that were stolen from our family during the war. When I hear word, I will let you know. I have no idea what he means, but something hooks into me and stays. The thing about the invisible door is that it defies space and time. You may walk through it many years later. And that's exactly what happens. Fifteen years later, a package arrives in the mail. It's what my uncle calls the German atonement package. His package was postmarked from Germany. Inside was a check drawn from a Swiss bank account. 
and it was paper clipped to a photograph, a black and white photograph of my family. He took the photograph and made copies of it on his computer and sent it to everyone in the family. And then he took the money, the money that was stolen from my family during the Holocaust, and gave us each a portion. I took the photograph to my mom, but she either didn't want to talk about it or couldn't, and so I took it to my grandfather. He picked it up in his hands, and he read what was on the back of that photograph. 1937, Kitchen, Moulin Rouge, Paris, France. And then he turned it over and described what was in the picture. My mom is here. She's four years old. She's wearing a frilly dress. She has bangs. She looks like a young Anne Frank. She's being held into my arms by my grandfather, Frederick Ashkenis. He's a dancer at the Moulin Rouge. He's got long jet black hair down past his belt line. And he's wearing a frilly shirt, like a pirate shirt. It, it covers his chest and his chin. And he's standing beside the famous French mime, Marcel Marceau. And he's standing beside my grandmother, Hilda Bergman Ashkenis. And she's beautiful. I barely recognize her. She's a painter. She helps my grandfather design the sets at the Moulin Rouge. She's the cousin of the famous Hollywood starlet Ingrid Bergman. And she's holding my uncle's hand, my uncle Michel, who's only six, and he's standing beside the famous jazz guitarist, Django Reinhardt. And they're all staring into the camera in the kitchen at the Moulin Rouge like the world is full of possibility to them, like the world is full of the morning. But I want to know more. And when I asked my grandfather to tell me more about the picture, this is what he says. He adjusts his ascot, hits his pipe on his palm, sets it down, and begins to speak. Shortly after the picture was taken, uh, Germany passed a new law called the Reich Chamber of Culture, promoting the obligatory assimilation of all cultural activities. Jews were deemed excluded from all the arts and expected, expected to, sense, uh, to censor themselves or fear risk loss of their livelihood. And so the artists from the Moulin Rouge began to leave. And uh, Marcel Marceau was the first one to join the French resistance. Your grandmother wanted to join immediately and follow her friend in because for her, well, for her, being part of a creative community was more important than the family itself. Uh, but I did not want to separate the family up. Uh, but I eventually understood that it was more than just a Jewish fight. It was a creative fight as well. And so, me and your grandmother, we sent your mother and your uncle to live in a Catholic mission in the southern Vichy Couture areas of France. And for the next three years, they were raised as Catholics. And your grandmother and I, we helped Allied Airmen escape over the enemy lines. Sometimes when a town had been run, over, been run over by the Gestapo, the, the resistance would throw us in prison where it was safe, and there we would fabricate entire histories from themselves. I would end up changing my name over 15 times, and your grandmother just as much. Your grandmother, though, when they made the law that we had to wear stars on our clothing, well, she refused, and it became to get dangerous. And so I knew it was time. I got the family, and we piled in the back seat of a steamship bound for America. And now the stage was set. When we came through Ellis Island, I decided to change the family name from Ashkenaz to Ash to sound more American. And from that point on, our family would literally be known as the Ashes. I got a tailor. I got a job at a tailor at a, at a little uh, department store because I learned to sew at the costume shop at the Moulin Rouge. And your mother, your grandmother, got a job as a accountant in the Department of Taxation, but something existed between us, a chasm that we could not ever connect again. We loved each other, but we loved this place where we had been creative and part of our creative community, but we could never get back to that place, and so we existed between this chasm, between what was and what we had now. My grandfather turned the picture back over and gave it to me. It is the only picture I keep beside my bedside table, even now. I knew that he had found a moment in Rice and he had paddled out through a creative impulse, through a crossroads, and went through that door, and that door changed his life and my life forever. And the money, the money that I received, I didn't know what to do with that money. I felt like I had been gifted this huge problem. I mean, my family practically died for this money. I didn't want to blow it on something trivial. And so when that night, I hit my knees with that check in my hand and offered a prayer to God. I asked for something to direct my financial decision. The next morning when I woke up, there was a $100 bill laying by the front tire of my car, and I knew this was 
the sign I'd been asking for. And so I called my father. He's a passionate Sicilian sculptor, and he's perfected in Italian what we know as the art of la rangiarsi de agiarsi, the art of making something from nothing. And he said I should buy something with that $100 that would always remind me of this dilemma about, about uh, trusting my creative impulse. And so that night I went online, and I found a company based out of Jerusalem that sold silver rings with Hebrew inscriptions on them. They were mostly based for lovers. The, the sayings on them said things like, I am my beloved, my beloved is mine, I have loved you with an everlasting love, and I found the perfect one. It read, Basher Talchi Alech, where you will go, I will go. It was perfect. To me, it spoke to that problem I sometimes have when I would paddle out and find my creative impulse in that moment of rice, about trusting and where that direction may take me. The ring was $100. It included shipping and tax. And I remember when the little, the little um, envelope arrived in my mailbox. It was no bigger than a uh, Pop-Tart. And I ripped it open. I put that ring on my finger. Basher Talchielek, where you will go, I will go. I still wear it today. I'd like to stick around. But uh, I've got to get on my surfboard and paddle out somewhere else now. I know that with life, and it's the same with dreams, sometimes we don't come back with what we thought we were going to get. Sometimes we come back with more than we could have ever imagined. Sometimes, I don't know. Sometimes I know we have to wait it out. Perhaps you have a story like mine. Because all I have left is a story. I created this story six years ago. And every time I told it, I gave away $18 of my family's Holocaust money until it was all gone. The money's gone. I have this story. Perhaps you have a story like this that's as simple as paddling out on a surfboard into a creative impulse and coming back with nothing. If you have a story like that, I encourage you to tell it often because the world needs more moments in rice the more the world needs more stories.